Someone recently posted this comment on one of my other videos. Why are your videos so long? To which I replied, they are intended to be detailed and useful as opposed to attention grabbing. Let's be clear, it will be very difficult to achieve a 9 in the IGCSE English Language Examination. So if you're hoping this is going to be a 10 minute video in which, hey presto, the metaphorical key to unlocking the door to multiple 9s is magically provided, then you need to look elsewhere. However, if you are prepared to concentrate and focus, complete the activities specified on screen, then I can promise you that you will significantly boost your chances of success and some of you will obtain that golden number nine. So who is this video aimed at? Well, three groups. Firstly, pupils who are not intimately familiar with this new exam and would like to become more so. Secondly, pupils who do know the exam well but would like to fine tune their technique and understanding of the exam requirements, thus increasing their chances of achieving a nine. And thirdly, teachers who may like to use sections of this video with their year 11 English classes. At the time of recording, there was very little sample material available from CIE, and so I have written both the exam paper and the model answers myself, closely based on the specimen paper available on the website. It's obviously quite difficult to transform a full reading comprehension paper into a YouTube video. How have I got round some of these difficulties? Well, firstly, I use a colour system. Light blue is for the examination paper and questions. Green is for when I want you to attempt responses to the questions on screen. Dark yellow is for answers and the mark scheme. One slight difficulty has been showing both passages and questions on the screen at the same time to enable you to write your practice responses. Fortunately, in this exam, the questions frequently refer to an individual paragraph, which is easy to show on screen along with the accompanying question. Although in the exam, you will need to be vigilant to make sure that you do always take your answer from the correct paragraph. They won't kindly put them together, as I do here. Question 3C invites you to compare two texts for a longer response, and so this has been more fiddly. However, rest assured that I will always give clear instructions. You will be asked to pause the video at key points, and then with 3C, you will need to toggle five seconds forward to access the appropriate passages. So this video is entitled, How to Achieve a 9 in the IGCC English Language Examination. In a moment, we will get down to details and look at the practice paper that I have written. But I would suggest the following principles are essential if you want a chance of achieving that top grade. Number one, read regularly in your spare time. How else will your own style develop the maturity and sophistication required for the highest marks? Number two, you need to be able to write with flawless accuracy. Used to missing out apostrophes, mixing up there, theirs, inserting a comma rather than a full stop, you will need to eradicate these errors. Number three, you need to show a precise, detailed understanding of the passages. Number four, you need to have practiced past questions remorselessly, each time increasing your mark and developing, developing your understanding of the exam requirements. You've heard enough from me for the moment. Let's introduce passage A from this practice paper and question one. Passage A, Tom Sawyer. The extract is taken from The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. In this extract, Tom struggles to concentrate on his homework. Tom's heart ached to be free, or else to have something of interest to do to pass the time other than answering so many dreary questions. His hand wandered into his pocket, and his face lit up with the glow of gratitude that was prayer, though he did not know it. Then furtively, the percussion cap box came out. He released the tick and put him on the long flat desk. The creature probably glowed with the gratitude that amounted to prayer too, at this moment, but it was premature, for when he started thankfully to travel off, Tom turned him aside with a pin and made him take a new direction. 
Tom's bosom friend sat next to him, suffering just as Tom had been, and now he was deeply and gratefully interested in this entertainment in an instant. This bosom friend was Joe Harper. The two boys were sworn friends all the week, and in battled enemies on Saturdays. Joe took a pin out of his lapel and began to assist in exercising the prisoner. The sport grew in interest momentarily. Soon Tom said that they were they were interfering with it, with each other, and neither getting the fullest benefit of the tick. So he put Joe's slate on the desk and drew a line down the middle of, of it from top to bottom. Now, he said, as long as he is on your side, you can stir him up, and I'll let him alone. But if you let him get away and get onto my side, you're to leave him alone as long as I can keep him from crossing over. All right, go ahead, start him up. The tick escaped from Tom presently and crossed the equator. Joe harassed him a while, and then he got away and crossed back again. This change of base occurred often. While one boy was worrying the tick with absorbing interest, the other would look on with interest as strong. The two heads bowed together over the slate, and the two souls dead to all things else. At last the luck seemed to settle and abide with Joe. The tick tried this, that, and the other course, and got as excited and as anxious as the boys themselves, but time and again, just as he would have victory in his very grasp, so to speak, and Tom's fingers would be twitching to begin, Joe's pin would deftly head him off and keep possession. At last Tom could stand it no longer. The temptation was too strong. So he reached out and lent a hand with his pin. Joe was angry in a moment. He said he, Tom, you let him alone. Look here, Joe Harper. Whose tick is that? I don't care whose tick he is. He's on my side of the line, and you shan't touch him. Well, I'll just bet I will, though. He's mine, Tick, and I'll do what I blame, please, with him, or die. A tremendous whack came down on Tom's shoulders, and its duplicate on Joe's, and for the space of two minutes the dust continued to fly from the two jackets, and the whole school to enjoy it. The boys had been too absorbed to notice the hush that had stolen upon the room a while before when the masker came tiptoeing down the room and stood over them. He had contemplated a good part of the performance before he contributed his bit of variety to it. Thus chastened, Tom made an honest effort to study, but the turmoil within him was too great. In the geography homework, he turned lakes into mountains, mountains into rivers, and rivers into continents till chaos was come again. Then in the spelling sheet he got turned down by a succession of mere baby words. So at last, with the sigh and a yawn, he gave it up. It seemed to him that the new noon recess would never come, that he would be trapped within this cauldron of learning for eternity. The air was utterly dead. There was not a breath, breath stirring. It was the sleepiest of sleepy days. The drowsing murmur of the five and twenty study and scholars Soothed the, soothed the soul like the spell that is in the murmur of bees. Away off in the flaming sunshine, Cardiff Hill lifted its soft green sides through a shimmering veil of heat, tinted with the purple of distance. A few birds floated on lazy wing high in the air. No other living thing was visible but some cows, and they were asleep. Question 1 a. Reread paragraph 1. Tom's heart ate to be free. 1. Using your own words, describe Tom's feeling whilst working on his homework. 2. Using your own words, describe Tom's feelings at realising he has a tick in his pocket. B. What impression do you get of Tom's relationship with Joe Harper as described in paragraph 2? C. Using your own words, explain the meaning of the following phrases as they are used in the paragraph 5. 1. Absorbing interest. 2. Twitching to begin. D. Reread these lines from paragraph 10. A tremendous whack came down on Tom's shoulders and its duplicate on Joe's, and for the space of two minutes the dust continued to fly from the two jackets. 
using your own words, explain how both of the phrases in italics are used by the writer to describe the master's actions and its effects. E. What impression does the writer give of Tom's work, as described in paragraph 11? F. Reread paragraph 12. Explain how the writer uses language to describe Tom's feelings, the atmosphere within the classroom, the area around Cardiff Hill. In your answer, you should select powerful words and phrases, explain how the writer has created effects by using this language. You should write about 200 to 300 words. Given that 1F is worth so many more marks than the other components of question 1, it's worth looking briefly at the upper bands of the mark scheme. To get a band 6, you need a wide-ranging and perceptive discussion of language, so you'll need to include plenty of carefully chosen quotations and talk about their effects with precision. There is no room for waffle in this question. Rather than say that a phrase creates a good effect, say exactly what this effect is. Imagery relates to similes and metaphors. Zoom in on these language devices as you're rereading the paragraph and look to write two or three sentences exploring each one. Look for the words like or as to help you find a simile in the shortest time possible. It's your turn now. Complete question one, handwriting your response on some A4 paper if this is what you will be doing in the exam. Remember, only short, quick responses are needed for these early questions. Press pause now and start writing. Question 1b is worth two marks, so you're looking to make two points now within two sentences. Press pause and continue writing. Question 1c requires a precise understanding of the phrases as used within the context. If you don't know the exact meanings, look up the words in a dictionary. Get writing and press pause. Things are getting a little trickier now. Remember to use your own words here so that you are showing understanding and not merely copying. The number of lines shown gives an indication of how much you need to write to achieve the full three marks. Press pause. We've moved up from three marks to four marks, so you're looking to make four separate points that can be credited. Press pause and produce some wonderfully precise analysis. This is the 15 mark question. I do not think it is possible to achieve full marks by writing only 200 words. You should aim for at least 300. How else can you manage to show off a wide ranging and perceptive understanding of language? There's some lovely imagery here for you to explore. Enjoy and press pause. Well done. You've just completed question one. It's now time to see how you've got on. In the next section, I've either typed out suggested bullet point answers as would be found on a mark scheme or written a response in for myself. Compare your response to the mark scheme and make a judgment about your own score. Remember, if in doubt, it's better to be on the harsh side. I suspect your examiners will be. These responses can be very brief indeed. I've suggested three different adjectives to describe Tom's feelings for question 1a1, but words with similar meanings should also be accepted. The key principle is that you shouldn't spend too much time on these questions, so we won't. The idea is to identify the fact that the boys get on extremely well at school, but fight outside school on a Saturday or the weekend. In order to achieve the full two marks, I think you need to show an understanding of embattled, i.e. that the pair physically fight. In order to get the full two marks for one, you need to show you understand what absorbing means, i.e. the boy's attention is being completely consumed. 
You also need to state what the boys are so interested in, the tick. For two, you need to show that you understand that twitching is a slight physical movement from Tom's fingers, and also that you know why the fingers are moving. They are desperate to be able to torment the tick. This passage does not directly state that the boys are being beaten. However, you need to infer it from the context. To get the full three marks, you need to explore the word whack. It is a fast, powerful movement, and also show you understand the inference of dust continuing to fly. The beating is causing spots of dust to fly up from the boys' jackets. You need to focus precisely on the question here. Note the first sentence of the model immediately answers the question, i.e. that Tom doesn't understand what he is doing at all and his work reflects this. The best answers will explore the idea of lakes becoming mountains, mountains, rivers, concluding that Tom's work is completely inaccurate and that he would seemingly have no understanding of basic geography. You also need to infer problems with basic spelling as implied within the idea of him being turned down by baby words. This answer has three bullet points. Make it easy for the examiner to mark Split your writing into three paragraphs. Just a reminder about the mark scheme, you need to be precise and develop your points about the quotations you have chosen. When exploring similes and metaphors, you need to explore associations as well as the explicit meaning. I'll show you what I mean. Here's my response to the first bullet point. Explore how the writer uses language to describe Tom's feelings. Note the lack of an introductory first sentence. Some of my own pupils have been tempted to begin with sentences such as, the writer uses many language devices and techniques to describe Tom's feelings, but you can't get a mark for that. You need to say immediately how Tom's feelings are described and use a quotation to back up your point. Note that I've picked out imagery mentioned explicitly on the mark scheme and developed my points about the cauldron. Firstly, it suggests that Tom is feeling confined, closed up. More imaginative analysis is needed to achieve a nine though. And so I point out that cauldrons are typically associated with witches, thus creating a link between two similarly bewildering and alien worlds, the classroom and the supernatural. As well as commenting on imagery, being able to identify sentence types and their effects can show the examiner that you understand how language works. Here identif I identify the three consecutive simple sentences, and if you're not sure about the precise differences between simple, compound and complex sentences, look them up and learn them, and point out that this helps create a calm and peaceful environment. Once again I find some imagery, this time a simile, and explore its effects. In this response to the final bullet point from question 1f, I provide insight into the tricky phrase, shimmering veil of heat. Weaker candidates will either not know or have only a vague understanding of the exact meaning of shimmering. If in doubt whilst completing any practice papers, look up words in a dictionary. Make this a regular routine. Become genuinely interested in language and the exact meanings of words. I look up approximately 20 words in a dictionary per week, yet I have an English literature degree. How many words do you look up? Note also the close analysis of the effects of the verb floating within this response. Do you use technical terminology in your own analysis? As well as being potentially able to pinpoint a type of sentence, simple, compound or complex, can you also correctly identify parts of speech? Whilst identifying these features will not in itself gain you the highest marks, it will add a tremendous precision to your analysis and exploration of the effects of particular words and phrases. Would you like to move on to passage B in question 2? I suspect you would. Passage B. A father's fight against homework. Ever returned from home, exhausted from a hellish day at work, only to be confronted with the prospect of not just cooking, 
not just cleaning, not preparing the kids' bags for the next day, but having to sit down with each child to supervise, and in many cases, complete ridiculous homework assignments. Well, if you're in the su suffering majority, then you may well consider Clint Henderson, your knight in shining armour. For this enterprising father has started a popular petition against what he describes as the cancer that is homework. The chief problem with homework, he snorts, is that it stops kids being kids. Even 30 minutes of a homework a day can take huge chunks out of a kid's most, much needed time for independent play and creativity. We need to stop attempting to plan every second of our child's lives. Clint is not alone in holding these views. A recent BBC documentary found that a significant proportion of primary teachers would like homework to be abolished completely. One teacher, who did not want to be named for fear of reprisals, felt that homework can often weaken understanding of topics studied in class. Pupils work completely differently at home, she stated, and my experience is that parents may introduce different ways of approaching topics, especially in mathematics, which are outdated and merely confuse. There is some anecdotal evidence to support this view. A year six pupil was interviewed in the documentary and described the conflict and tension in her household at homework time, with her father insisting that she should use a particular technique for long division that she had not studied in school and didn't understand. Additionally, in this age of the internet and its boundless opportunities for self-education, what right do namby-pamby teachers have to dictate what our young people should be learning in the evening? A single click of the mouse on the computer can transport us across the globe to extraordinary facts about the Amazon and on magical journeys in Alaska. Why should we deny our children the right to explore? For Clint Henderson, the fight has only just begun. This courageous man will not be given in without a fight. Until, in his words, the tyranny of homework has been firmly consigned to the waste bin. Question 2. Imagine that you are a teacher who believes passionately in the importance of homework. Write a brief report on the school's governors explaining what you think is wrong with the points made in passage B. You are advised to write no more than 250 words. I've included a section of the mark scheme here which is split into two sections. Up to 10 marks are available for your understanding and response to the text and 15 marks on how well, how accurately, your report is written. So it's your turn now. The screen now shows the full passage and the question. Press pause, take your time and write your report. Well done! Provided you've been following the instructions, you should just now have completed question two. I will now explore the mark scheme in a bit more detail and show you my own response. Compare your answer to the one on screen and make a judgment about your own score. Don't be too generous. We all know that complacency is a root of all evils. What are the key issues here? Well, within the reading mark scheme, you need to have interpreted a wide range of relevant ideas. So you have included numerous references to the pas passage, of course ensuring that you have used your own words and not just copied. Note the second bullet point within the reading mark scheme. Both implicit and explicit ideas need to be taken. In one of my recent lessons we were reading Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence and came across a very good example of implicit explicit meaning. In chapter 21, a cheeky grandmother teases her shy, newlywed granddaughter who is visiting with her new husband. She cries out, Ain't there going to be any daughters? Only boys, eh? Good gracious, look at her blushing again, all over her blushes. The explicit meaning here is that the newlywed is going to give birth at some point. However, the reason she blushes and the implicit meaning is that she has surely been, quite naturally, having sex with her husband. What about the writing mark scheme? Well, as this is a report to the school's governors, the language and tone used need to be consistently formal. 
I think using a wide range of punctuation is important for this question. The very best writers will be able to use semicolons, colons, dashes, question marks accurately. Look now at what you have written. Have you got the full range of punctuation? Do you know how to use, for example, colons and semicolons accurately? If you're not 100% sure, look them up and write out some practice sentences. What about the way your sentences begin? Do they, all too often, begin with the or I? Or, is, or are there some pleasing variety, with some sentences being varied by beginning with subordinate clauses, for example? Here's my response. Press pause and read it to yourself. Notice the formal tone used and the fact the purpose of the report is clearly stated in the opening short paragraph. The reading mark scheme asks you to assimilate information, to show that you have understood new information and reused it within a different context. Let's zoom in to show this in practice. Note how I have assimilated the words of Clint Henderson, the complaining parent. He said, we need to stop attempting to plan every second of our children's lives, which I have transformed succinctly to overscheduling children's lives is ultimately destructive. But of course, as well as showing an understanding in your own words, you also need to argue against the points. I do this by using a formal, sophisticated, complex sentence structure which begins with whilst. This allows me to give the impression of measured, balanced thought by agreeing to some extent with the original idea before arguing against it. Notice also how I incorporate a colon and thus show the examiner that I can use a wide range of punctuation precisely. The colon also allows the sentence to build up to a punchy conclusion. Here's another example of how I first assimilate the ideas in the text and then argue against it. The original passage includes the primary school teacher fretting that parents may introduce different ways of approaching topics, especially in maths, which can confuse. This is transformed into the slightly different perspective backed up in the subsequent paragraph of passage B of parents and their difficulties. Once again, I argue against this by introducing another line about the advantages of developing a deeper conceptual understanding. The writing mark scheme looks for a variety of sentence structures. The sentences in this response begin with the following words. Following, arguments, whilst, in, some, rather, the, however, homework, I. How does this compare with your own response? Note also the precise use of formal, well-chosen, occasionally sophisticated vocabulary. You might pick out words such as parameters, conceptual, consolidated. If you have a wide vocabulary, show it off, provided of course it fits naturally into the context. Still going strong? Well in that case it's time to move on to passage C and question 3. Passage C. The importance of homework in a child's education. Homework is important because it is at the intersection between home and school. It serves as a window through which you can observe your children's education and express positive attitudes towards your children and their education. As children grow older, homework and the amount of time engaged in homework increases in importance. For teachers and administrators, homework is a cost-effective way to provide additional instru instruction in practice. Let's examine the six constructive purposes for homework in the context of your child's educational experience. The first two are the most important and obvious. Through practice and, and, and participation in learning tasks, homework can improve your child's achievement. Thus, it would be expected that if homework were completed accurately, not only would your child's general knowledge and grades improve, but your child would also increase mastery of basic academic skills such as reading, writing, spelling and mathematics. Homework can provide other benefits. Your child's ability to bring an assignment home, 
gather and organize necessary materials to complete the assignment, return the assignment and receive a grade, strengthens his or her sense of responsibility. Time management skills are learned. There is also improved development of personal skills, such as time management gained by completing homework. Furthermore, when homework proceeds smoothly, it can become a positive aspect of your relationship with your child. Finally, although we, do, although we often do not consider that homework serves a school administrative role, it offers schools an opportunity to let parents know what their children are learning. Thus, homework can play a public relations role by keeping parents informed about class activities and policies. Homework can also fulfil an administrative role in helping schools achieve their overall mission of improving students' achievement. Homework is a bridge that joins schools and parents. From the school's perspective, there is the opportunity to monitor students' independent progress. For parents, there is the potential to gain a greater appreciation of education and to express positive attitudes towards their children's achievement. Read carefully passage B, A Father's Fla Fight Against Homework, and passage C, The Importance of Homework in a Child's Education. Passage B, A Father's Fight Against Homework. Question 3a. Reread paragraph 1, Ever Returned Home Exhausted from a Hellish Day at Work. 1. The writer thinks that Clint Henderson is a heroic figure. Identify a phrase that shows this. 2. Using your own words, explain reasons given for the implicit view in paragraph 1 that parents should not have to help their children with their homework. Passage C. The importance of homework in a child's education. Question 3. B. Reread the final paragraph. Homework is a bridge that. B. Give one reason to explain why you think this paragraph is an effective conclusion to this article. Question 3. C. C. How do the writers of Passage B, A Mother's Fight Against Homework, and Passage C, The Importance of Homework in a Child's Education, convey their views and ideas on the importance of homework, and what effects do they have on the reader? In your response, you should compare and contrast the views and ideas each writer presents to the reader, the evidence that the writers use to support their views and ideas, the language, structure and, techni and techniques used by the writers and their effects on the reader. Remember to support your answer with the details from the passages. You should write about 300 to 350 words. As with the other longer questions, 1F worth 15 marks and question 2 worth 25 marks, I have included the mark scheme for the top band. What is interesting here is that you are only marked for your reading understanding. In theory this means that you won't be penalised for writing errors. But I wonder about the psychological effect and irritation on an examiner at seeing sloppy errors such as missing apostrophes. Even if a piece of writing does show an excellent understanding of the two passages and compares them insightfully, do you think an examiner would be able to bring themselves to award full marks faced with feeble writing errors? It's your turn now to attempt the two quick questions required for 3A. Press pause and get writing. Here's question 3b. Press pause once again and write. Now for question 3c. You will find passage b 5 seconds on from this slide and passage c 5 seconds on from that slide. We read the questions and articles again carefully before putting pen to paper. Press pause. Well done. Provided you've been following the instructions, you should just have completed question three and a full IGCSE English language paper one. 
Let's have a look at my answers and the mark scheme. It goes without saying that you need to complete the one mark questions quickly. I hope the answer to 3A1 is pretty straightforward. Enterprising father would be an incorrect response. To be heroic, you need to be more than enterprising, I'm afraid. In question 3A2, it's fine to identify the chores, i.e. cleaning, cooking, provided you use your own words. However, only one mark is available for any of the chores listed in your own words. The other mark needs to reference the parents being tired. I appreciate that this question asks for one reason. It is debatable whether this response gives two reasons or just develops the first. Either way, the principle is paramount. Two marks needs two points. Returning to the mark scheme for 3C, I want to draw attention to one adjective that appears persistently throughout the mark schemes for both paper 1 and paper 2. Precise. That's what you need to be aiming for. No words wasted through vague, wishy-washy analysis. You need to think carefully before writing and then explore the exact effects of words and phrases. As before, I've written one paragraph per bullet point. Press pause and read this through. Note how I've immediately started comparing by beginning the opening sentence with whereas. Other useful phrases that force a comparison include another key difference and in contrast. The aim here is to sum up and compare and contrast the key ideas in the text succinctly. Here's the second bullet point. Press pause and read. When referring to evidence, you are likely to reference experts, statistics, quotations, or point out evidence of personal beliefs. Note how I question the vagueness of the statistics in passage B, a significant proportion of primary teachers. In doing so, I am building my own critical evaluation to use another phrase in the mark scheme. And the final bullet point. Press pause and read. Short quotations are clearly vital here so that you hone in precisely on specific differences in the language used within the two texts. There is far more bias and hyperbolic language in passage B, making it very easy to pull out soundbite S quotations. The tone of passage C is far more restrained and neutral. Well then, well then, how to sum up this video aiming to boost your chances of achieving a 9 in the IGCSE English language reading paper? Well, a key principle is practice. The more practice papers you complete, the better, provided, of course, you involve yourself actively in the mark scheme so you know exactly why you didn't achieve full marks in any of the sections. But also, let's not forget that this is an English examination. You need to show off how well, how gloriously accurately you can write and how well you understand what you read. Good luck. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, exploring the IGCSE English Language 627 reading paper. Many thanks for watching.